Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we'll take a walk on the wild side with Super Saturday's Animal Quest. We'll also embark on a voyage to the Far East, exploring a few highlights from this year's cultural series, which runs throughout the month of October. And we'll experience yoga, discovering the practical and profound benefits this form of exercise can provide. But first, let's sit back and enjoy a special Mount Prospect Public Library Foundation event, featuring the timeless tale, Miara, Selkie from the Sea. A bittersweet and somewhat familiar story of love, loss, and transformation comes to life during this unique multimedia experience performed by singer-songwriter Linda Marie Smith. It's a love story based on the Celtic legend of the Selkie. And a Selkie is a mysterious seal who has the ability to transform into a human being. About 20 years ago, I saw this incredible movie called The Secret of Roan Inish, and it was about the tale of the Selkie. And I was just intrigued by the story, and who knew that 20 years later I was going to be writing my own piece about this amazing story. Smith's version of this timeless tale couples her original songs with the stunning illustrations of Chicago graphic artists Catherine and Sarah Satrun, who incidentally happen to be twin sisters. It's a concert multimedia experience that most people don't see something like this, so it's unique. I have these incredible musicians that I play with, one being my husband, Robert Arndt, and um, Catherine Hughes, who is an amazing violinist, and Eugenia Elliott, flautist and vocalist as well. And I've been playing with these folks for years, and I'm very, very lucky to have them in my, as part of my ensemble. Smith's ensemble provides a rich melodic orchestration essential in underscoring the magical message intrinsic to this storyline. Miara the Selkie um, discovers a fisherman, a lonely fisherman named Ian, and he discovers her as well and they fall in love. And she transforms into a human being and they begin a life together and they have two children and just it goes on and on from there. Miara, Selkie from the Sea, is sponsored by the Mount Prospect Public Library Foundation, a nonprofit organization which raises money for special programming and events like this. I think this is amazing. Um, I, I'm just so appreciative that the library is so open to things that are a little bit, a little bit more unique and kind of off the beaten path. And but I feel that this is just a story for everyone to hear. Um, and uh, so I'm just thrilled to be here. During the month of October, the Mount Prospect Public Library Annual Cultural Series will be making a voyage to the Far East, exploring the fascinating aspects of the countries that share the South China Sea. Joining me today on Library Life to discuss a few of these exotic destinations is world traveler Bill Helmuth. Welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Let's start out by talking a little bit about your background as a photojournalist and columnist. Well, thank you. I went to Northwestern University many years ago, got a master's degree, was a music teacher, and then I got into the book business and worked with World Book Encyclopedia for many years, living in Honolulu, Hawaii, among other places. And you just have an interest in things. And before I became a professional photojournalist, I took tens of thousands of pictures all over the world. I've lived on four continents. I've been to 110 countries. I've flown over five million air miles. And with all of these wonderful, gorgeous, exotic places, I was able to organize these photos into over a hundred different PowerPoint programs worldwide. And so I just uh, was able to organize these digitally and now I am able to travel through the United States giving programs to about 20,000 people a year. Now that's fascinating. I've written for the Chicago Tribune uh, for, for several years right now and uh, also do my lectures in places like Elmhurst College and Chicago Cultural Center downtown among others. 
this. My goodness, what a life you've had. Mm, mm, mm. Now you're going to be presenting three programs during our annual cultural series. And you're going to be taking patrons on virtual tours of China, Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia. So why don't you give us a little bit of a geographical overview of this part of the world? Well, they all share some part of the South China Sea. This area is just north of the equator, so it's very hot and humid. You have the ocean storms, you have the monsoons, and as you may recall, about two or three years ago, there was a, uh, a, a um, earthquake that set off a tsunami that mm -hmm. really caused tens of thousands of horrible deaths along the shores of both Thailand and India itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have mountains, and you have uh, plains, and you have rice paddies. Rice, of course, is a primary product which is there. So, so many of the people in Malaysia and in Thailand and southern China are devoted to agriculture and growing food. You've talked about some of the similarities that these countries share, but I'd like to also delve into some of the differences that these countries have. Well, from a cultural point of view, we have Thailand, which has evolved into a Buddhist state. Mm -hmm. You have the Thai people, the Thai tribe, which over the, the literally the, the centuries and millennia has come to form itself into Thailand. It's a country of about nearly 200,000 square miles, which is roughly the same size as California and uh, um, Indiana combined. Uh, the uh, Malaysian Peninsula is roughly 130,000 square miles, or about the size of Montana. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, China is about the size of the continental United States plus Alaska. And so when you s go into these countries, they have their own unique individual personality, their own cultural stamp. Now, they tend to have uh, types of brownish yellowish skin as you would expect in people of southeastern Asia. Right. The Chinese literally have formed a common denominator in that through the many many centuries Chinese explorers have come into what's now Malaysia and into Thailand, the traders, the religionists, and so there's a huge Chinese um, uh, imprimatur you might say in these countries and the Chinese tend to do very well economically as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Thailand has a unique distinction of being the only Southeastern Asian country which has never had a European colonization. Wow. So unlike Malaysia, which started with the Portuguese in the 1500s and then the Dutch a couple hundred years later, and finally the English and the British that were there, uh, Thailand has had its own its own history, its own government without being governed by others as well. Now how did Thailand escape from that? One has to wonder because when you look at India, of course India was a colony of, uh, England. of, of England for right. many hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Certainly um, Indonesia, which almost borders these countries as an island nation, has had a Dutch influence since the 1600s. Uh, Malaysia and Singapore have again had an English influence, but right next door to Thailand, you have Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam mm -hmm. that all had a French colonial past, which they were able to shed within the last 50 to 60 years. Wow. <laughs> well, I'd like to go through, I know that you, you're doing all these separately, yes, yes. but let's talk a little bit about some of the other unique aspects mm -hmm. of each of the countries. And I'd like to start with the most populous, yes. which of course is China. Of course, yes, yes. Well, I lived in Hong Kong for several years, and I was very fortunate to travel extensively throughout China itself. Um, there is so much to see. You cannot take one trip to China. You cannot even live in China for a lifetime and see everything you should see. Yes. But certainly, uh, it is a communist country relative to its governance. It's a communist one-party state, and the government literally has control over the governmental aspects. However, it is a capitalist country as well, mm -hmm. okay? So it is not a sin to be rich, Mao Zedong <laughs> said many years ago. <laughs> and so the Chinese are really entrepreneurs and they, uh, they have approximately 300 million people that are devoted exclusively to agriculture and farming. In the United States, we have about 3 million people who are devoted to the actual farming process. But it's important that you see Hong Kong and certainly um, 
Um, Shanghai, Beijing is the capital. I did take a train trip starting in Beijing a few years ago, the Trans-Siberian Railroad that went all the way through Mongolia, Siberia, oh my and goodness. Up, up to Moscow, 6,000 wow. miles in six days. But it is rapidly uh, modernizing and people want to come from the farms to the big city where life is, of course, a little bit more richer and fuller. Uh, the Han Chinese are those we associate with Chinese characteristics. Uh -huh. However, when you go out to far western China, you have the Taklamakan Desert, the second largest only to the Sahara Desert in Africa. And then you have the huge mountain ranges, the Tin Shins, the Kunluns. You have, of course, the Himalayas and the huge Tibetan Plateau. But there's a group of people there called Uyghurs, spelled U-I-G-H-U-R. The Uyghurs look like they may be from Eastern Europe or from Turkey. And in fact, they are communist Chinese uh, Muslims. Mm -hmm. And there's about 10 million of them roughly that live in little villages that border the uh, Kora Karams and of course the Pakistani mountains. So you have all these different racial influences uh, that have fused together over these many, many centuries in, in all the countries that we're going to visit. Now, if you could uh, think of, of three destinations that you would say are must-sees in the country of China, yes, yes, yes. what would you say they are? Well, I would certainly say you must, uh, you must go to Beijing. North of Beijing, you are going to uh, go to the Great Wall of China, mm -hmm. which protected the peace-loving Chinese from the warmongering Mongolians, so to speak. Um, so that is number one. If you can do it, a trip down the Yangtze River through the Three Gorges Dam area. The Yangtze is the hardest working river in the world. 400 million people depend upon oh the Yangtze River for their livelihood. And then certainly I would want to go to Xi'an to see the Terracotta Warriors. Always wanted to see them, never got to I see I actually them. was there and I sat down and talked with the farmer mm -hmm. who 35 years ago was farming his field with a, with a hoe and he hit something. He dusts away the dirt and here is the top of a head of a terracotta warrior. They'd been buried for over 2,000 years, just a foot below the surface. And there's 8,000 that have been uncovered today. So those are some of the phenomenal uh, places. There are many, many more, of course, but those are the three that I would say are uh, highly recommended. And if you do have a chance sometime, take the Silk Road journey, starting in Xi'an all the way through western China that eventually ends up 5,000 miles later in Istanbul. I've been on that entire journey over land through Iran and through all the other countries over a period of years. Oh my goodness, yeah. how exciting. All right, now we're gonna fly over to Thailand. Yes. You, you mentioned a little bit about yeah. Thailand already, yeah. but tell us a little bit more about some of the must-sees of Thailand. Yes, well, you know, look, Thailand is one of those peaceful countries. Uh, its official religion, of course, is Buddhism, and so they are a nice, quiet, they tend to be happy, hard-working people. Bangkok is one of the world's great cities. It has all of the universities, it has the uh, hospitals, it has the health care, the educational system. So they have subways and some of the world's very greatest hotels, like the Oriental, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's also very busy. And, uh, <laughs> you very gotta, crowded. If, if you think Chicago uh, you know, uh, expressways are crowded, try Bangkok <laughs> sometime. But once you get out beyond the great city itself, you can go south to Phuket, which is on this thin strip of land that is part of the Malay Peninsula. And uh, this is where you have your great resorts. North in the mountains, you have Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai. And these are just gorgeous areas, you know, similar to like the Smoky Mountains. And here's where the, the government, uh, uh, the, the royalty, uh, happened to preside. Now, one of the things about Thailand is that it's a constitutional monarchy. Mm -hmm. It used to be called Siam, as in the king and I am and the of king course, of Siam until of 1939. Mm -hmm. And then it flipped over to Thailand today. Uh, similarly, um, Malaysia is a constitutional monarchy. You still have, you know, kings and queens and princes that, like in England, reign but they don't rule. They leave that up to the uh, 
to the, uh, to the parliament and to the prime ministers. They do share a common border, but it's a peaceful border. And you're not likely to hear or see about these countries in the evening news because they tend to be peaceful and quiet and they're not disturbing the, their, their neighbor and, uh, and going across the border. So they're both uh, accessible. Certainly uh, Malaysia is mostly Islamic. Oh, okay. And yes, it is. It is uh, a brand of Sunni Islam which uh, tends again to be peaceful. But uh, they're both accessible countries and if you take a trip to Southeastern Asia, certainly you'll want to visit Thailand and if you can go down to both Singapore and to Malaysia itself. Yeah. Right, I'd like to concentrate on Singapore for a, for a second here because yes. I know you lived there for yes. three years. Yes, I have. And yes. you must have some insider's knowledge. So yes. tell me a little bit about Singapore. Well, Singapore is a country that has rules. It separated itself from what was then Malaya in 1965. Now it's Malaysia. Singapore is largely Chinese dominated. However, there's a large uh, ethnic groups of both Indians from, from East India as well as the Malaysians that call themselves Boomies. That is their nickname like we are American Yanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Singapore has about four million people, ultra modern. There are no ghettos there. Whoa. People are trained to make money. You have all of the great Western uh, companies like Google and Microsoft and Oracle and General Motors are there. And uh, so you, you're going to school not to learn how to sew clothes and, you know, make shoes, but to do electronics and to uh, do computers and uh, the most modern. It is a very clean city. You can walk down the darkest alley at 3 o'clock in the morning because you will uh, uh, you'll be safe. But you must obey the rules. When you come to Singapore, you are given a landing certificate. And it says, death to drug offenders. Oh, my goodness. And every week or so, someone comes through with cocaine or heroin. And believe it or not, they're picked up at the airport. Within 24 hours, they're either shot or they're hung in the police office. Oh no goodness. judge, no jury, no attorneys, no appellate court. So while it is very clean and very organized, as someone, one of my Chinese friends said, it's like living in a gilded birdcage. <laughs> yeah. Nevertheless, uh, I found a very uh, a significant place. They have symphony orchestras. Uh, they have uh, opera houses. Some of the world's greatest shopping is there, wonderful hotels, a totally safe place, and it's a must place to see. I would say if you only see a few places on your three-week trip to Southeastern Asia, Bangkok and Singapore and probably Hong Kong would be the three cities that I would most uh, recommend. Well, I thank you so much for coming and being with me today. <laughs> this was a whirlwind tour. Thank you. Just something to basically whet the appetite of our patrons out there so they come to see your yes. programs yes. in yes. October. Well, I hope that will happen, yes. Uh, it is going to be, I think, a, uh, an insightful program. We're going to try to inform as well as entertain a little bit. and But to give you the, the understanding, because we generally don't study these countries when we're in school. And mm -hmm. unless you go to the library and read books and go with Google, you have very little, uh, not even surface information about them. So we're going to really show the faces as well as the places the pulse and the personality of the place, which I think will be very interesting for your patrons. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for being with Thank me you, today. Thank you, Kathy. Aren't you kind? Thank you so much. Thank you. The Mount Prospect Public Library Annual Cultural Series is sponsored through the generosity of the Elizabeth J. Clue Memorial Fund. For more information on these programs or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, call the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. Yoga is a popular practice with ancient origins. Let's peek in on an afternoon encore presentation encouraging patrons to experience yoga. Yoga is a very practical art. Uh, what yoga can really do is help our total population regain its health and move towards a, a more uh, comfortable state of well-being. 
Local yoga instructor Stephen Nakon presents 25 library patrons with an introductory lesson he calls Yoga at Ease during this interactive Mount Prospect Public Library afternoon encore event. Traditionally, yoga was designed as a meditative uh, experience, so hence the, 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 the languaging Yoga at Ease. What we're going to be doing is presenting a practice that is both relaxing, refreshing and rejuvenating that's available to all levels of students, uh, uh, young or old, uh, with any level of fitness. The owner of Whole Journey Northwest Yoga, Nakon provides a well-rounded approach to this multifaceted discipline. We in include the, the classical forms of yoga, that's called asana, uh, and the, the movement practices when, when postures are linked together is called vinyasa. So we do vinyasa asana practice. We simplify it by saying it's mindful movement. Uh, we move with the breath. Uh, we move it in to and out from the poses, uh, linked uh, breath to breath, pose to pose. Uh, we use adaptations and modifications of the classical yoga poses like the triangle or the tree uh, and use them in such a way that they're available for all levels of students, whether well-practiced or just beginners. A yoga enthusiast since college, Nakon has been immersing himself in the business of yoga for more than two decades. We have been fortunate enough to develop good partnerships uh, with uh, venues that allow us to teach uh, to audiences that might not normally come into contact with yoga. So, for example, some of our clients have been uh, corporations like More Business Forms, Motorola. We also ha have developed a real good relationship with a lot of the nonprofits. For example, we developed a yoga program for the Museum of Contemporary Art. Our main focus today is at the Chicago Botanic Garden. We've been partners with the gardens for uh, over 15 years now. Nakon prides himself in being able to teach clients of all ages and stages of flexibility. Flexibility is a uh, oft-used term and sometimes a bit misunderstood because we're all flexible. If you can walk in the room, if you can raise your arm, that shows some level of flexibility. There's value in certain levels of uh, stiffness, if you will. Uh, we prefer to think of it as res the resiliency of the muscular skeletal system. What we do is incorporate movements that stretch those muscles and tissues that require stretching and strengthen those muscles and tissues that help us stay stable. So it's a combination. So you don't have to be flexible to do yoga, uh, but it certainly helps your flexibility. If you're uh, breathing, uh, you can do yoga. Uh, we do yoga with people in wheelchairs. We do yoga with people who have uh, severe physical disabilities uh, and we do yoga for fit and athletic 20 year olds you know there's a whole range of what yoga can do so yoga adapts to the student rather than the student adapting to yoga at least that's our approach now that we've relaxed with yoga it's time to get those heartbeats racing again with a good political thriller here's readers advisor Jenny Massa with her best book pick from the adult services department what if those closest to the President of the United States couldn't be trusted with his safety? In The First Patient by Michael Palmer, strange episodes have begun to plague the country's leader, and his personal physician has mysteriously disappeared. Dr. Gabe Singleton, an old friend of the President's, is asked to take the job. Not long after arriving in Washington, he realizes that his college buddy is in the midst of a health crisis that could have national ramifications. Gabe must balance dedication to his patient with responsibility to his country, and attacks on his own life only add to his suspicions. Michael Palmer crafts a tense thriller that explores frightening scientific abuses and the vulnerability of the leader of the free world. Recommendations from the Adult Services Department this month are political thrillers. Critical by Robin Cook is a fast-paced medical mystery surrounding the sudden appearance of deadly drug-resistant staph infections at a string of freestanding surgical hospitals for the perfectly insured. The Judas Gate by Jack Higgins follows the investigation of an ambush that takes out U.S. Army Rangers and a British medical team where evidence points to the possibility of a traitor within the ranks. 
In the Inner Circle by Brad Meltzer, an archivist stumbles upon an antique dictionary linked to George Washington that unearths both secrets and conspiracies. The Water's Lovely by Ruth Rendell is a creepy read filled with plot twists regarding the reemergence of a 12-year-old murder mystery. And The Lions of Lucerne by Brad Thor is an action-packed thriller following the quest of a fearless Secret Service agent who must find a kidnapped president and avenge the deaths of the 30 comrades he lost during the abduction. Recommendations from the Youth Services Department this month are Illuminated Reads. In Flora and Ulysses, The Illuminated Adventures by Kate DiCamillo, a comic reading cynic is amazed when a squirrel demonstrates astonishing powers of strength and flight after recovering from a vacuum cleaner accident. The Oxford Illustrated Book of American Children's Poems, edited by Donald Hall, is an anthology of poetry from colonial alphabet rhymes and Native American cradle songs to contemporary works. Castle, How It Works by David McCauley follows the planning, construction, and ultimate testing in battle of a typical fortress built by the English during the Middle Ages. And in The Houdini Box by Brian Selznick, a chance encounter with famous magician Harry Houdini leaves a small boy in possession of a mysterious box that could hold the secrets to the greatest magic tricks ever performed. Finally, here's preschool and child care outreach liaison Jan Penner with her best book pick from the Youth Services Department. The Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins, an illuminating history of Mr. Waterhouse Hawkins, artist and lecturer by Barbara Curley. Dinosaurs, what might they have looked like? You may have drawn many pictures of your ideas about them, but in this history, the dinosaurs are drawn by a man who lived during the 19th century. Since his childhood, Mr. Hawkins had been drawing and sculpting animals and naturally began recreating his own ideas of how dinosaurs might have looked using small pieces of real fossil remains. Mr. Hawkins was commissioned by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to build life-size models of his dinosaur sketches for the Art and Science Museum in London. People marveled at these beautifully painted and detailed creatures made of bricks, tiles, broken stones, and cement. Mr. Waterhouse came to New York City with hopes of sharing the fascinating dinosaurs in Central Park. Sadly though, the dinosaurs that he built over a period of two years were smashed and broken pieces were scattered throughout the park. Mr. Hawkins kept very detailed drawings as new dinosaur bones and fragments were discovered. He returned to England to the news that 30 new iguanodon skeletons had been discovered there in a coal mine. New facts were learned and his sketches changed a little bit with each new discovery. Many facts have changed about the things we know now about dinosaurs, but it doesn't make the old models any less valuable. Those models first got people excited about dinosaurs and we're still excited over 150 years later. If you love animals, you'll love this next feature, placing a spotlight on Super Saturday's Animal Quest. Some of the world's most interesting and exotic creatures are on display for families to enjoy as Mount Prospect Public Library's Super Saturday takes patrons on an animal quest. We take the animals out one at a time. Uh, depending on how many kids there are, everybody touch a lot of them, a little guessing game. Uh, but otherwise, I flap my gums about them and uh, often, you know, this has got kids in the crowd talk about whether or not they make good pets. Animal care specialist Steve Reedy and his assistant Rebecca facilitate this interactive 45-minute presentation with humor and plenty of educational animal tidbits. What they eat, where they're from, how they behave, and how they uh, give you warning signs that they are unhappy about something so you don't have to go about getting bit. And uh, sometimes general care stuff and little tidbits, factoids, etc. We got a Kawada Mundi, Patagonian Mara, uh, African spur-legged tortoise, giant African bullfrog, uh, Flemish giant rabbit. 
A native of Crystal Lake, Reedy went west to learn his craft. I went to school at Moore Park College in uh, Moore Park, California. They have uh, a teaching zoo on the campus called America's Teaching Zoo. Uh, enrolled in a two-year program where you are basically a zookeeper for free and you take academics about uh, animal diversity, behavior, uh, care, wildlife education, which is technically what this will be. Reedy opened his own business, Animal Quest, Education Through Entertainment, three years ago and currently works his magic at various venues, from schools to senior centers in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. When we book a show, all we really do is uh, we ask for a, a list of what you know, maybe you guys want to see and then we try and match it up with you know, the other shows that we have that day. But I like a little bit of variety anyway, touch base on everything. Uh, but there is a couple I like to like pair, like the guinea pig and the cavy, or the mara, because they're actually pretty close relatives, but they're kind of worlds apart. A man on a mission, Reedy seeks to leave his audience better informed about the misunderstood animals of the world. Years and years go by, you know, and people spread the same little rumors or myths about animals. Uh, so a big part uh, is, you know, dispelling the myths, I would say. Super Saturday's Animal Quest is just one example of the many entertaining, informational, and educational events featured here at the Mount Prospect Public Library every month. Don't miss any library programs you'd like to experience. Here's a list of events scheduled in September and October. Reservations are strongly recommended. For more information regarding these events, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. You will also find a listing and description of all upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library events in your library newsletter preview. Earlier in the program, we took a virtual voyage to the Far East, exploring some of the events in our annual cultural series running throughout the month of October. With this in mind, our Library Life camera today asked the question, if you could travel anywhere in the Far East, where would you go and why? Here are some responses. Uh, probably Japan, and I'm just more interested in the culture and people in Japan. I would go to Japan because I absolutely love Japanese cuisine. Um, first I was thinking Japan, but then I thought, no, actually I would like to go to China. Cambodia to see Angkor Wat. It's an ancient um, castle, goes back 1400 years. Some people even think it was built by aliens. <laughs> that wraps up this edition of Library Life. For more information on any of the Mount Prospect Public Library services and events highlighted here, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.